Welcome back, everyone. This is, I think, part three uh, of talking about the Realm DMA system. Uh, it's been a couple weeks uh, since the last one, uh, and, and some of the ideas actually uh, relate directly. So I wanted to remind folks what we talked about before. Um, so uh, the first time we did this, we focused mostly on kind of the high level interface, uh, basically implementation of the actual copy method on index spaces um, and how that turned into a transfer descriptor object, which basically is the thing that uh, transfer description object is the thing that uh, describes the, the plan for doing a copy in terms of, you know, which, which memories are we going to use? What's the path we're going to take between them? Uh, whether we need any intermediate buffers or the like. Um, and then a transfer operation, which was responsible for taking this plan and actually basically instantiating that plan uh, for a given copy. Um, and then in the second time around, we talked about how how the path planning and the like works for in the in the analysis for the transfer descriptor. And we kind of stopped at the part where um, if we look at uh, so there was perform analysis, which was doing. Uh, all the careful path planning and the like. Um, and then once that was done, we would um, go to the next step, which is allocate IBs. So if there are any multi-hop copies being done, this is where we would say, you know, once once all the preconditions have been satisfied for actually doing the copy, then it's okay to commit and actually go allocate the uh, temporary memory that's needed by it. Um, and then once that is done, then, um, so this is the allocator stuff. And then the third step in as far as the transfer operator is concerned is the uh, create XD step, uh, which is down here somewhere. So this is the thing now that we've got the memory associated with it. Now we actually want to create the little things that track um, in general, most of the transfers being done. It, it, it's, well, it's actually a common, but not, not completely dominant case that you can do the entire transfer with a single, you know, mem copy or could a mem copy call. In, in many cases, it needs to be done in, in smaller pieces, either because there's fragmentation or because there's multiple hops or, or the like. And you and as a result, you need um, uh, so flow control. And so you need um, each step in the overall transfer plan to have some sort of data structure associated with it that uh, understands what progress has been made on it so that it can, uh, you know, so it knows how to stop in the middle if there's full control issues for, or the like and knows how to pick it up when there's uh, new data and, and remember where it was and the like. And for any given for any given hop in a transfer plan, that's called a transfer descriptor. Um, uh, it remembers the the intermediate state and so the last step of a transfer operation once all the planning has been done and we know the intermediate uh, buffers are created then we basically go through the transfer graph which is part of the transfer description and for each node in the transfer graph we're going to basically instantiate an actual transfer descriptor of the appropriate type uh that that will will track the progress of that that piece of the copy and, and as, as as we'll see the the different transfer descriptors in the same copy will be coupled together via flow control but each of them basically operates as its own uh, you know its own little co-routing if you will um and so the code here is basically um taking the contents of the of the transfer uh description graph and for each node basically taking the the template information that's in this xd template and turning it into the actual arguments it will be passed down to a call down here to to do uh, there's a lot of cases for uh inputs outputs we'll talk about in a moment but eventually we get down to the part where we say okay let's actually create a transfer descriptor uh, and we call this on a factory object that was also provided as part of the path planning and each 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 channel has a different kind of specialized transfer descriptor and so you need a channel specific factory to create the transfer descriptor uh, uh, of the right type. Um, this call will either create a local transfer descriptor if the target node is a current node, or it will actually send an active message to to remote node um, to um, uh, to create it there if, if that's where it should run. Uh, the other thing every transfer descriptor has is a globally unique ID, which is used to uh, you know both name the transfer descriptor and also allow each transfer descriptor to name um it's it's peers when it comes to flow control right if one transfer descriptor is writing to an intermediate buffer and there's a different transfer descriptor that's going to be reading the contents of that intermediate buffer they need to know how to signal each other when when data has been pushed or, or read uh and they do that through through uh, these globally unique ids um so at a at a 
at a high level, the things we're giving the transfer descriptor creator is, um, uh, this is actually handled back to ourselves so we know which copy we're from. Then we need to say where the origin node is and where this is gonna run, give it its, its uh, unique ID, and then some data structures that list the one or more inputs that that transfer descriptor is gonna read from, the one or more outputs it's gonna write to, um, if it has uh, a priority, uh, we, send, we send the priority with that. And then some, some transfer uh, descriptors take care of doing reductions or doing fills. And in that case, then we need to give them a little bit more information. Um, the, once, we, once we've gotten to this part, once we've gotten, created all the transfer descriptors, then the actual transfer operation is mostly done. It just needs to, it's just gonna now sit around and wait till each of the transfer descriptors say that they're individually done. And, and once every transfer descriptor is individually done, then the whole, the whole copy is considered to be done. Um, so uh, as always, I assume people interrupt me with questions as they as they have them. I'm going to hop over here now to the transfer descriptor stuff is defined over in channel.h and cc. So if we go look in here, there's a parent class transfer descriptor, um, which uh, let me kind of go through this. So let's walk through this a little bit and then uh, we'll get into some of the uh, some more details. So every transfer descriptor. Uh, remember, has a pointer to which DNA request uh, begat it, and, and in large part, this is so that when we're done, we know who to signal to say, hey, you can check one transfer descriptor off the list. Um, every transfer descriptor is also associated with a transfer descriptor queue. A transfer descriptor queue is a queue of transfer descriptors that are are ready in, in the sense that they could make you know non-zero progress if if they were told to make progress. And so this is basically the, how the you know the scheduling of what to do when is done. And uh, where this queue comes from is it usually belongs to the channel that the transfer descriptor is in. Uh, but the important thing here is just that a transfer descriptor know which queue it's in so that it can requeue itself when 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 ready. Uh, we need to know who launched it uh, so we can report back. Um, the transfer descriptors, uh, the mem copy transfer descriptor that we'll look at first is actually pretty easy because it's purely synchronous. But most other transfer descriptors uh, have a bit of multi-threading or asynchrony to them because, you know, for example, you kick off a CUDA DMA, it doesn't finish right away. You, you can queue up a whole bunch of them and later on be told that some of them are done. And so a bunch of the things in this data structure have to be uh, multi-thread friendly. Uh, and so you'll see a number of atomics in various places. Um, the um, uh, uh, what the two most important kind of bits, state bits in the transfer descriptor are uh, iteration completed and transfer completed. Um, and they're very similar. Iteration completed is basically saying that we have finished iterating through the, the copy domain and issued all the reads and you know, copies and loads and stores that we're going to issue. And, and therefore we're not going to, so when iteration completed is set to true, that means that, that we're done uh, we're done issuing stuff and we're just waiting for stuff to finish. Um, but you're in this limbo st state where until stuff is finished, you can't actually say the copy is done. And so then we have a different uh, uh, tracking boolean to say that you know the whole transfer is now completed it, it is is uh, is when that you've issued everything and everything is completed. All the individual copies and loads and stores or whatever uh, have have finished and that you can start tearing this thing down. Um, there are, uh, as I mentioned, every transfer descriptor has some number of input ports and output ports. So we have a vector of those here. And each port has a whole bunch of stuff associated with it. Uh, so first is every, every port is always reading or writing from some location in some realm memory. Uh, and so um, we need a pointer to the, the implementation of that memory here. And one important thing that's a little bit confusing when you look at the innards of, innards of, of, of realm is in, in Realm, there's memories, which are strictly application visible memories. So you only application data goes in them. And then there's IB memories, which are strictly for intermediate buffers. And in, in Realm handle space, those are completely disjoint and you can never get one when you ask for the other. It turns out that in the implementation, both of them inherit from memory impl behind the scenes. And so this, this thing could either be an application memory or it could be an intermediate buffer. Uh, and they have enough of the same API that, that we can refer to them the same way. Uh, the other thing every transfer port has is a, an associated iterator object, which basically is the thing that tell that is responsible for generating the addresses into this memory. Uh, and for for uh, source and destination instances, these iterators can be pretty complicated because uh, they can you need to handle dimension ordering and you know arbitrary strides of layouts and the like. 
Um, when you're, we're working with intermediate buffers, these iterators tend to be very simple kind of wrapping uh, FIFO iterators um, that basically treat the, you know, the contents of that intermediate buffer as, as, a, as a FIFO. Uh, and so a simpler iterator, but it, again, it goes through the same interface. Um, serialization, deserialization, I'm going to leave aside for now. It's a fairly niche corner case. Um, uh, I did say that uh, when we're doing multi-hop stuff, we need to know who our neighbor or peer uh, transfer descriptor is so we can do flow control with them. And you need to know um, uh, two things for that. You need to know what the, the UI unique ID for the peer is. And then since every peer can have multiple inputs or outputs, you need to know, you need to be able to say uh, which port index it is. And so, you know, the input of the one transfer descriptor is somebody else's output. And so you need to know the ID of that transfer descriptor and which, which index into into that peers output um, uh, port specter uh, to look at. And so whenever we do flow control, that we're basically sending these two you know these two things as, as unique identifying which which port on 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 a peer uh, transfer descriptor and then we'll say things like, oh and I wrote this many bytes uh, or the like. Um, indirections happen uh, when you are doing scatters and gathers where where the addresses are actually coming from yet another input. Um, so if you're doing, um, you know, uh, transpo transposes or, or, you know, weird layouts and stuff, then the, all that information to compute the addresses is baked into the transfer, uh, into the transfer iterator. But when your address needs to be based on, you know, go fetch the contents of this other field and it will tell you which index to compute the address for, then you need a, you need a way to get the, uh, you know, get those, go, those indices. And, and those come from indirect ports. And so uh, if you are an actual source of indirection data, then, then this indirect is indirect port is set. If you're a consumer of indirection data, then uh, this indirect port IDX will be set to something uh, non-negative. Say that, okay, then, then the, the, we, the, the transfer area will know to consume from that port, but we also need it for flow control reasons. We need to know the port directly, which is why it shows up here. Um, the the next piece here is how we're going to track partial progress, right? I said we don't we often don't do the copy in 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 one fell swoop. We often do it in pieces, and we need to understand um, uh, what pieces we've done, what pieces we still need to do. Um, and there is um, uh, we'll describe a subset of this for now, and and. Again, some of some of the, some of the squirreliness comes with the serialization, which I'm skipping for now. So the most important fields here are local bytes total, and this is basically how many bytes worth of transfers have we initiated uh, locally uh, in this in this thing. And so, for example, I talked about iteration completed. Right, iteration completed will be true once local bytes total has reached the reached the desired count, assuming you know what the desired count is. Um, in contrast, remote bytes total. Is is only set when the actual data movement is completed, uh, and you know that the data is available on the other side, either because you wrote data or or kind of an anti-dependency. You you've you successfully finished reading the data, allowing to be overwritten by your upstream producer. And so remote bytes total will often lag local bytes total if there's any if there's any asynchrony. Um, in the case of memcopy, it turns out these two will update together because because we're totally synchronous. Um, the last thing we need, though, is we need um, uh, the sequence assembler objects. And so the other thing that happens when transfers are asynchronous is that they don't necessarily finish in order. And so if it's possible that transactions can finish out of order, like say on a network, then we need some way to to understand if there's holes in the sequence, right? We just can't count. It's not sufficient to count just the number of bytes that have been completed because it might not be contiguous. And so the sequence assembler, let me jump over to that real quick. Um, is, um, is a relatively simple external interface with a bunch of scary uh, lock-free implementation inside of it. So um, the most important operations it has on it is add span, which is a way of basically saying, um, mark that some contiguous range of, of uh, bytes have have either been read or written, depending on whether this is the uh, a read sequence or assembler or out, output sequence assembler. Um, and this doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be contiguous with the previous ones. It can it can it can um, there can be holes as long as you come back and fill them. And then a corresponding query that basically says, given a certain range starting at one point and going to a certain count, has that area been completely covered? 
And so, for example, you can imagine a sequence assembler where your upstream uh, producer uh, writes into a buffer and effectively calls add span on your remote sequence uh, to tell you when, um, um, you know, which data values have been written. And then if you want to do the next operation locally, you need to ask, okay, well, the first thing I would do, does add span exist? Um, and uh, in the common case, right, things are showing up in order and we want a very simple lock-free way of basically con tracking contiguous progress. And that's what this contiguous amount uh, field is doing. But we reserve one little LSB that we can set in a lock-free way to basically say, oh yeah, and there are things that are non-contiguous beyond it. And that's tracked in, in the rest of this data structure. And so in the simple case where you are, um, tacking spans onto the end of what you did before and and, and uh, varying against contiguous ranges, then basically everything comes out of this contig amount field. Uh, if you start doing spans that are out of order, then, um, then we start uh, basically marking where the spans are and, and tracking uh, uh, where they start. And then the span exists check also gets a little bit more expensive. Does but so the most common case, sorry, go ahead. Does the channel say oh. like which, whether it does things in order or not. Um, and like, how do you know when you start getting spans out of order? Is that, um, I'm assuming- it's, detect it's detected here. And at least right now, there's there's no huge benefit to being promised ahead of time that they'll never come out of order. Okay. Because it uses the fast case until something out of order shows up. Okay. So essentially the only the only thing we're really paying for in, in the case where it's all gonna stay in order is the constructor for this map, which I think is not a big deal. Yeah. Uh, okay. So like. I mean, I guess, couldn't you have like skipped a step where like you actually put the data, so sequence assembler is actually working on like an intermediate buffer, right? On like the far side of a, of a copy, right? Um, You're right, Any, anywhere where there is um, an intermediate buffer, then mm -hmm. you've got sequence assemblers on, uh, 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 to track both the local progress and the remote progress uh, for, right. for that intermediate buffer. Okay. So like, and and if if you're talking to an actual you know real instance, then these are never used. Basically, the flow control is disabled when you're talking to an actual instance. So in the case where like I'm doing a like frame buffer to frame buffer copy using GPU direct, are there sequence assemblers associated with that or no? Yes, because since using GPU direct, the it's possible that the uh, uh, results come back uh, that things complete out of order. I guess if it's a single hop, then you don't technically need to know that they completed, you know, right, then you do just care that the total number of bytes were delivered. Um, yeah, that's I don't what, think we, I don't care if we optimize out that case. Um, yeah, because like in that case, I would hope that like there's no intermediate buffers, but but things could still come out of order. So like, how does that? That's right. and and And, in theory, that's a case where you could just count total number of bytes because you don't actually care which order the pieces show up in. Uh, but I don't know if we special case that, right? If there's if there's an intermediate buffer on the side, then you very much need to know exactly which which interval it is. Okay. Um, and and so, for example, a common pattern that shows up uh, in in a bunch of the legate tests is that we're doing GPU direct, but we're using a local intermediate buffer to pack data that wasn't contiguous. Uh, right. If you do a 2D right. or 3D copy that, that that doesn't flatten out, then we actually pack that locally, and so you'll see a, you know, a a local uh, device to device mem copy uh, into an intermediate buffer, and then a you know a second transfer to descriptor, which is doing the the much larger uh, GPU direct copies to the to the destination GPU, and then if you're unlucky, an unpack on the other side as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, so it's. Uh, okay. Yeah, like I said, these things these are designed to not be too, if, if it never gets out of order, then these things are pretty cheap, yeah. uh, but they need to handle the case where they can't get out of order. Okay, and in the case um, of like, uh, well, one last case, like in the case of like yep. an NVLink channel, like between two GPUs with NVLink between them, like, uh, so you issue all the rights, um, how, how do you know they've actually been applied? Do you push a memory fence or something or? And like, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure I was going to get to that code, but yeah, basically anything that okay. anything that's asynchronous and any anything that's asynchronous is really anything other than memcopy. Okay. Um, is 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 going to have the pattern of you know initiate some initiate some uh, copies, 
and then do a fence or a you know event record or or something to that effect to basically know when those things are done, okay. and then that will be the thing that comes in and updates these uh, these sequences colors. All right, all right. Uh, and and we do try to batch them up. You know, if you can if you can do a whole bunch of copies and have one event speak for them, yeah. then that gets handled as one sequence rather than a bunch of individual sequences, sub sequences. Does the underlying network? Uh, like uh, GasNet or UCX, does it typically uh, do these things out of order? They're mostly in order, uh, and 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 it it, it depends depends exactly on the network. It depends on in some cases um, the phase of the moon, um, and it is, however, the case that um, network technology is getting more towards out of order going forward. Uh, people are building things that are more. Uh, uh, for for basically being able to load balance and, and deal with congestion, uh, the trend in high performance networking is to get more out of order going forward. And but that is also exposed to you, uh, and I, I would assume that the network might try to present a in order completion uh, to you rather than exposing the out of orderness. That well, so like the way we like yeah the way we do it for Gaston, I think also for UCX is that every single you know remote put or get gets its own completion sent back to the application, and so there's no okay. assumption that the chain of them happen in order. When when we do could use, we absolutely you know do a bunch and then put one event record behind it because we know that a stream in CUDA stays in order. All right, if we were to if we were to spread data across multiple streams in CUDA, then we'd have the same out of order potential potential there as well. Okay, makes sense. Okay. Uh, the last two things, um, we, if we are doing an intermediate buffer, then we do need to remember what buffer we are using because as soon as this transfer descriptor is done, uh, basically as soon as you're done reading from an intermediate buffer, we immediately free it up to, to make it uh, available to somebody else. We don't wait for the rest of the, um, uh, the, rest of the copy to finish. Um, and then the last thing which is important, um, and this is a, a you know, recent in the sense of only a couple years old rather than 10 years old as far as the Realm DMA system is concerned, is that I mentioned this transfer iterator, transfer iterator up here, where to go, uh, is responsible for generating addresses uh, that we're going to fetch from. It turns out that this interface is somewhat expensive to cross, and so you don't really want to do it for every single individual transfer. And so we've, uh, we've got a model now where uh, when you call into the transfer iterator, it's allowed to queue up a whole bunch of addresses, even if the flow control on the buffers um, you know, doesn't actually allow those transfers to happen yet, and those are accumulated in the address list. And this is an easy, this is a cheaper thing to to consult uh, than than the iterator itself. Uh, so think of it kind of like a, a prefetching, if you will, of stuff from the iterator. And so for that, we need an address list, and then the cursor is the thing that actually tracks where within the address list uh, we are. Um, the last important piece here is is this control port stuff. Um, and so I mentioned it's possible for for a Transfer descriptor have multiple inputs or multiple outputs. Uh, that can happen in scatter and gather, the most common cases where that can happen. Um, but it also happens in indirection, for example, that uh, you might have multiple inputs. But in, in cases where you are scattering and gathering, uh, you need to know often, you know, which input, uh, let's say if you scatter from, sorry, if you gather from four different instances into one instance, then you need to be able to know which of those four instances am I pulling data from right now? Because uh, basically what's going to happen is each, each gather instance is going to stream its subset of the data, uh, but you need, you need some way of reserializing at the end. And that's what this control port is doing. It's basically a way of controlling. If you've got multiple inputs, then uh, you might have another uh, port that gives you control information about how to how to, how to flex between them. And similarly, if you have multiple outputs, you might have a control port telling you how to, how to uh, uh, demultiplex um, uh, outputs for, for, say, a scatter. And so, so basically, there's three different kinds of input data that can come through an input port: either you know actual field data that's being moved, or address data that's handling a you know an unstructured indirection, or it could be control data that's driving one of these control ports. And it turns out you can have two in, you can have two different ports: you can have an input control port and an output control port. Um, and uh, because you can actually have cases where you're both scattering and gathering. Uh, and so this has some logic as well, so that we can, you know, uh, track. You know, you might be told, okay, the next megabyte worth is coming from input port one, and then this. So you need some some a way to track. Well, how much of the megabyte have done? Have I done? And when do I need to get the next bit of information from the from the control? 
So this is the this is basically all the intermediate state of a transfer descriptor. Uh, there are different transfer descriptors for different kinds of each channel. Basically, has its own kind of transfer descriptor. Um, they tend to specialize just the methods and not so much the, the the data structure. The data structure part is pretty stable across all of them. Uh, one one difference shows up in different some different transfer descriptors will have a place to store fill data and some won't. For example, uh, because not everybody uh, not every transfer not every channel knows how to do fills. Um, there's also some older methods on a lot of these transfer descriptors that are basically, um, for the most part, out of use, like get requests you'll see in various places, but we're not going to um, uh, look at those. Similarly, request available. The, any, anything involving these request stars is pretty out of date. The, the main method that matters now is this thing called progress XD. Um, so maybe Okay. okay, so my plan is next to look at the memcopy transfer descriptor to show you a general shape of what a, a modern transfer descriptor looks like in implementation. Uh, and um, and then maybe we'll jump to a CUDA one to do something that's a little more complicated. Um, so right, the constructor is basically these same arguments you saw in that create transfer descriptor method uh, in, the, in the create XDs uh, method we started with today. These are basically showing up here. Either they came directly through or they got serialized and deserialized into an active message. But either way, they come back out and we, we create our transfer descriptor, basically copying all that information into these intermediate structures. Um, if there is, um, for example, the mem I, I wasn't gonna talk about serialization, but it turns out the memcopy transfer descriptor is one of the few that knows how to do serialization. So it has a load of extra logic in its constructor to, to recognize when that's happening. Um, and then the main method here is uh, that matters is this progress XD method. Um, I'll, I'll jump back and show some of the other ones in a moment, but let's focus on this one first. Um, and the serialization is actually one of the cases where we do go through the old uh, fairly inefficient path, but we're going to ignore that now and we're going to look at just this fast path below it. Um, and so importantly, when you call progress XD, uh, you're given the pointer to the channel you live in, uh, which is important because you might need to requeue yourself. Um, and because we're doing this in a background work context, uh, and I don't think I've, have I talked about the background work system in one of these meetings? I don't think I have yet. I don't um, think you've done that yet, no. Okay. Um, with, yeah, without getting too much into it, there you know there's lots of different things in Realm that do work in the background, like transfers and, and dependent partitioning and, and various other things. And rather than having threads dedicated to each kind of thing, um, Realm has a model now where there's there's a, a pool of general background workers that know how to do different kinds of uh, background work. And uh, all DNA channel stuff is background work. Um, and if you're going to use this interface, in an attempt to be a good citizen, uh, you when you're called, you're given a time limit. Uh, this is how long a time slice you have uh, to do your work. And the, the goal is that you you hold roughly to it, which isn't to say it's not preemptive or anything, but the idea is every so often you should check this. And if you're told that you're out of time, then you should stop doing work and, and yield your yield your progress, yield your background work thread uh, to, to work on some other items. So you'll see this appear in, in the loop below. Um, the, the basic structure of the loop, though, is that um, we are going to, um, in general, we need to remember whether we did any work uh, because we're going to want to return whether we did work and whether we're, we're making progress or not. And you know, if we didn't do any work and we're stuck, then we, we want to go to sleep. We don't want to keep trying. Um, I showed you those sequence assemblers and, and mentioned that ideally we, we don't do um, we don't add spans for each individual, uh, you know, four bytes or something we copy. We try to do it um, in larger chunks. And so there's a little helper object called a, a sequence cache, uh, which is basically the thing that quickly appends consecutive things and and only calls add span on the actual sequence assembler, uh, either at the end or when the span has gotten big enough that we want to, you know, flag to somebody that they can maybe start making progress to. And so somewhat arbitrarily, this is rigged to basically say, you know, accumulate up to two megabytes worth and then and then add do an add span. Um, but also when we when we finish one progress method, we always flush out any any pending sequences. Um, 
so the the basic pattern is that each transfer descriptor will will run in a loop, which is you know it's a wild true loop, but it's really wild. You know, while there is useful data to send and there is uh, room to send it, and I'm not out of time, and those are all done as as kind of break conditions instead. So so the pattern you'll see is that uh, the first thing we do is we um, we call get addresses, and get addresses is actually doing a bunch of things inside of it. Um, so uh, both related to control ports and flow control. So let's go find that real quick. So here, the first thing we're going to do is uh, right, we need that control info to even know which ports to read from. So the first thing we do is we update control info. Um, and it's possible that even the control info is, is pending new information coming in. So this can actually return zero if it turns out that there is um, you know, we don't even know which input we're supposed to read from next. Uh, and so that's one way you can early out here. Basically, if we don't even know which, which port we're reading from or writing from, then, then we return zero basically saying, you know, we can't make any progress right now. Um, if the, um, uh, once we do know it, then what we're going to do is we've got two sections here. One is going to look at the, the input and basically say, okay, now that I know which port I'm reading from, um, actually, I should say it's also possible for the control port to basically say there is no input or there is no output. Uh, and gathers or scatters where some addresses are out of range, right? Then you need to skip over, uh, 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 you know, addresses that are out of range. And that sometimes means that the, uh, on the gather side, right? If you're told that these addresses are out of range, then the, the right, the writer side of the gather loop needs to know how to skip over the address, you know, needs to know how to not write to those things, but then pick up in, in the correct spot going forward. So it's actually possible the control IO port will be negative one, which means there is no port. But if there is, then we need to consult it and basically say, okay, well, do you know what addresses you want to do? And, and if it's an indirect port, it might not even know that, in which case it'll it'll come back out. Um, and uh, so either we get the addresses or we're told that there aren't any. And then if there is, um, if this is talking to an intermediate buffer, then we also do logic to uh, to do flow control. All right. So this is the thing basically saying, okay, I know how many ports I would I know, know how many bytes I would like to read. Tell me if that span exists in the in the sequence assembler. Uh, and and this isn't a yes or no. It can actually return. A, you know, if you ask for a megabyte, it might say, okay, the whole megabyte isn't there, but the first 64 kilobytes are there. And so it return, okay, you know, shorten your read to 64 kilobytes, and then you can make progress. Um, or it might say zero, you know, the, the, that data isn't there yet, and, and you would you would fall out in, in that case if it's if it's zero. So basically, we do that for the input, and so we figure out how many bytes we would like to do uh, based on what how many addresses we we have. And again, right, the address list thing uh, can batch up a bunch of addresses, so it knows how to say this is how many bytes worth of addresses I have. And in, in on a good day, we'll go through all of them. But if flow control says sorry, you know, you can't get through all of them, some of that data isn't there, then we might trim it like that. And the output side is very similar. Basically, if there's an output port, then we again ask, okay, how many addresses do I have from you? Let's limit the size based on that. If I'm writing to an intermediate buffer, then I also I need to make sure that there's room to over, you know, that I'm allowed to overwrite the data that was there, um, uh, because we don't want to get too far ahead of the downstream reader, and um, uh, and and so we we might, we might uh, trim the size of the copy, uh, uh, the transfer in that case as well. Um, the last, so the two other things we do. Um, one is that if we get through all this and the transfer size is zero, uh, then it may actually be that this is an indication that we're done. And so we detect that case and, and begin the you know, completion um, uh, sort of descriptor. But the other case that's important is that if we go through this and we find there's a few bytes ready to go, but not an interesting amount, in particular less than what we said is a min transfer size, then we actually return zero also. And the idea here is to keep, avoid the case where you like trickle out, you know, eight bytes at a time. And so for example, memcopy was rigged to basically say, you know, if it's not four kilobytes worth, try to wait until it is at least four kilobytes worth. Um, with the exception being that, you know, if, if, if we're told that, you know, there's only two kilobytes and that's really all there's ever going to be, there's a bunch of cases in here to basically trim the min transfer side to make sure we don't, uh, you know, block forever on, on a, on a, you know, on a, um, on a misaligned final block of the thing, but but if, if we think there's more data coming and the current amount of data is is below some interesting amount, then we actually return zero and we actually go to sleep until until more data shows up. 
with the intent to, you know, it's better to do one bigger copy later than two smaller copies. But the end result of, of get addresses then, if we go back to mem copy transfer descriptor progress XD, is that we call that and what comes back is basically a, this is how many bytes you're allowed to transfer, right? It, whatever, whatever quantity here is guaranteed to have valid addresses on input and output. We know which ports we're reading from and writing to. We know uh, that flow control is compatible with it. And now it's just a matter of actually generating the, you know, the, the copies or the, or, or the transactions associated with it. If you get uh, a control control port message um, and that the data for that control port isn't available yet, do you skip to the next one? No, no, we have to do them in order. Uh, and, and and the reason the reason is that we are in the case of a gather, we're a slave to the iterator for the output instance. This says you know it knows what order it's going to write things, and so it's do, it you know it's, it's going to do a particular element next, and so that element has to come from from one specific input. And if that data isn't there yet, then we have to wait. Uh, take, okay. Doing that out of order would be massively complicated. And, okay, uh, so the control, the order of the, of the control port will be the same as yes. what the it out of what area or wants. Okay, that's right. In fact, that's how we generate the control order for information is we, we know that the output iterator is going to go the same as the input iterator did. Yep. Yep. Um, so this is so so now that we're the sounder loop is basically okay you know tell me how many bytes i can do if the answer was zero well then i'm going to hop out uh and if it was the first time then did work will say false which is important otherwise you'll see at the bottom of this loop will say did work equals true and so if we come around this loop a second time and on the second time there aren't any addresses then we'll break out but having did work equal true um and then here is the thing that's basically saying now that we know how many bytes it is it may be that it can't be one contiguous mem copy but we're allowed to issue multiple mem copies if we got time for it so um, as long as we have not exhausted the total number of bytes that we were allowed to do, this is where we use those address cursors to basically say, okay, you know, give me the next offset into the input instance and output instance. And this already knows which port it's talking to and everything. Um, and then based on those address cursors, uh, there's some logic to decide, you know, is it a 1D copy or a 2D copy or a 3D copy? Um, and since we're able to do 1D, 2D, and 3D, we consider all these cases here, but eventually we call something like mem copy 1D here, or down here will be a mem copy 2D. Um, and a little further will be a mem copy 3D. Uh, and um, above 3D right now, there's actually one or two cases people have seen where maybe a 4D might actually be worth doing. Um, and again, this is, uh, so whenever we issue a request, we immediately act advance the address cursors because now the request has been issued we can we can bump the address we're generating but we don't necessarily update the spans yet uh, and that's for two reasons first of all we we want those caches to glom together some spans in the, in in the sequential case uh, in the synchronous case but in the asynchronous case we we do need to immediately update the address list so we don't reissue the same request but we need to know that the transfers haven't necessarily completely completed yet um, and so in the case of, um, so, th th and so this is where, so right, I said in the case of mem copy where it's uh, synchronous, we can immediately add spans to, uh, to, the, uh, to the caches and, and, and indirectly to the sequence assemblers uh, here. Uh, and then the last step we do in the loop is we basically say, okay, this is how many total bytes we did. And this is the thing that goes back to the, the controller for the input ports uh, for the, uh, uh, sorry for the control ports and says, okay, this is how many bytes I consume so that the control port progress can be updated as well. Uh, and then we set did work equals true. Uh, and then at the bottom of the loop, we, we might finish for two reasons. First of all, we might be told, hey, you've done all the, all the transfers, in which case we can break out. Or that, that time slicing thing I talked about, that work until thing might say, okay, you know, you, you, you've had one go through the loop or, or however many goes you've had through the loop, it, it's now time to, to uh, let somebody else have a turn and we might break out for that reason. Um, and then either way, uh, we'll flush any any uh, sequences that we did cache but haven't reached that two meg limit uh, out to the corresponding assemblers. And then we'll return um, uh, whether or not we did any work. Um, and while people are queuing up any questions they might have on that, I need to open up one more file here. Um, I just wanna show real quick what the loop outside that progress XD is where, where that did work Boolean goes. Oops. Uh, Right, so this is um, 
uh, there's a templated widget that handles almost all cases of transfer descriptor queues. It's templated on both the channel and transfer descriptor type it, it works on. Uh, but so nearly all channels use this uh, this do work method. Uh, and if you see do work, then that tells you that that's that's one of the background work item. Uh, it's part of the background work. Uh, uh framework and so this thing here is operating over a whole queue so it's basically got a model where it, it pops something off the queue um and then it um uh, i'm gonna skip over that as background work stuff i'm not gonna trust that right now but once it's got a transfer request then it puts it in a loop of basically as long as it's not done with its transfer then go ahead and and ask it to make progress right and if it says it made progress then we can stay in a loop as long as we're out of time. If it says it didn't make any progress, then we need to have it go to sleep. And the um, there's a bit of a race condition with this because right this is a long, complicated thing. And so, how do we know that you know something in here failed, but before it came back, uh, it, something asynchronously marked that we had the data to uh, you know now the, now the next call would succeed. And so there's basically a a, a counter based thing where. Um, every transfer descriptor has a progress counter, which is basically just a, a monotonically incrementing counter. Every time anybody does something that might enable progress on the XD, then that progress counter is incremented. And that lets us do a, uh, a, a thread safe approach of basically before we call progress XD, we ask for the current state of the counter. And then if we didn't do any work, we, we do this atomic check for progress. They basically say, okay, is the counter still where it was? If it's still where it was, then we can safely go to sleep because we know that there wasn't any work available to us when we did this call and nobody has given us any new work. And so it's safe to go to sleep. And this is, this is an atomic thing that basically by calling this, if this returns, um, let me get the clarity right. right? If this returns false, then uh, the counter was still zero, and we're gonna we're gonna drop we're gonna basically go to sleep by basically effectively dropping the transfer descriptor as far as the queue is concerned, and the transfer descriptor itself will requeue itself when it's ready. Whereas if this thing returned true, that would be saying, hey, somebody did actually update that progress counter while you were calling this, so there may you know it may be that you saw it and there still wasn't work to do, but we're not sure, so we're actually gonna we're gonna loop around and do it again. And so whether if work was done or if somebody gave us some input data or out room for output uh, storage while we were calling it. Each of those cases will loop around again um, unless we were out of time, uh, in which case we'll, we'll, we'll stop. Um, if the transfer is completed, then we'll mark it finished. Um, and, then, and then right here, here again is that, you know, if, if the uh, time, slot, time slice is finished, then we can, um, uh, we can break out of loop as well. But the key thing here is that because it because of the asynchrony, we can't we can't safely say, oh, I didn't find any work, I should go to sleep. It may be that uh, that you know something you know nearly concurrently pushed in uh, data that will allow us to make progress. So we need to do this um, this kind of two two uh, uh, two phase uh, commit on on whether or not we should actually go to sleep or whether whether we should stay awake. Okay, any questions on the memcopy one? Uh, I can go to the CUDA one for, for a little more. Um, uh, actually, the CUDA one may be too exciting. Maybe I'll do the remote right one uh, as a slightly less exciting one. Uh, we have 10 minutes though, so if there's any questions on, on what we've done so far, I'd rather do that rather than layer CUDA or asynchrony on top of, on top of this if people are confused about the baseline. How do you time the mem copies? Like, uh, are you just using Realm's internal timers to to start and begin and the end of the? Like, how, how do you? Well, again, we're we're not we're not timing the copies. We're timing uh, the. Um, we're basically just doing stuff until we notice that the timer has expired, and so so. Right, the, but how, the, how often do you pull that uh, the expired? Right, okay, yeah. So, oops, am I in the wrong file? Uh, I am in the wrong file. Um, Okay. Um, right. So somewhere in here, do, 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 do each channel, uh, each, well, each transfer descriptor can do this differently. Um, but um, the magic for mem copy is this bit right here, uh, and this yeah. is not as precise as it could be. But basically, we just figure uh, the argument here is um, you always want to do enough of a copy that. You know that it's efficient. You don't want to. Right. You don't want to dribble out tiny little copies. Yeah. And so basically, this is saying, 
do up to 250. If, if you have more than 256 kilobytes to copy, then it's probably okay to break that up into multiple mem copies without creating a lot of overhead. So, so chop it up at that interval and, and take a peek each time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you figure, if you figure you've got a system memory with tens of gigabytes of, um, of, um, a bandwidth, then, you know, order 256 kilobytes is about, you know, 12, 13 microseconds and, and less on, you know, even less on future chips. Right. So it's still pretty responsive as far as background work stuff. 10, 10 microseconds is kind of the sweet spot for background work stuff. Um, and, and so that's, that's where the math comes here. But, you know, it, it in general, if you look at mem copy throughput, it, it saturates pretty quickly in, in the hundreds of kilobytes range anyway. So this is, this is not, um, there's not too much heartburn about having having a limit like this. Uh, it, you know, if we go around this loop once every 256 kilobytes, it, it's not a huge deal. <laughs> but you could over approximate. Like you could you could end up spending more time than your your allotted time slice. You, you so th this model always always overshoots. Yeah. Right. There, there, there's no there's no how much time is left. Let me try to gauge how much to do which, to just fill the time. It, it's do your next chunk of useful work, and then if that puts you over the limit, then stop. Yeah. So, so it, 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 it's best effort and, um, you know, again, right. If, if you never do any individual thing, that's more than 10 ish microseconds, then, then you should never order shoot by more than 10 microseconds. It's sort of the thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was thinking like you could do something more dynamic where like you had sort of like an exponential back off where like you sample a lot at the beginning of your copies. And then, you know, as you detect that you're not taking very long, you, you back off. Right to sampling much less frequently, and then as you get close to the end of your allocation, you start sampling more frequently to the point where you you detect that you're you're actually getting close to your your budget. Right, and and I think, I mean, in addition to it being a lot more complicated, I think if it caused me to do individual mem copies that weren't weren't locally, you know, uh, peak throughput, yeah, then I would feel like I made the wrong choice. Okay. So I, I think I, would, I, would, I think I would, you know, if it, it, yeah, but if you told me, hey, you only need 64 kilobytes to get peek through, but then I would happily dial this down to 64. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure it's quite that good. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay, a little bit of a magic number. There, okay. But yeah. A <laughs> little yeah. bit of a magic number, and and every transfer descriptor is going to have some sort of max size thing in there, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's often based on responsiveness. So, for example, the CUDA one has a pretty enormous one for device to device copies and a relatively smaller one for host to device and device to host because you don't want to, you know, yeah. block out PCI Express for 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 seconds with a multi gigabyte transfer. Um, it, it's you know really about making sure that, you know, in the case of mem copy, you want to make sure the actual mem copy loop on the CPU is running efficiently. Yeah. In the case of um, GP related transfers, right, you want to make sure that you've at least amortized the overhead of the uh, of the API call. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, let's go over to remote write transfer descriptor. So, so this is the transfer descriptor that's used for things that are going to be RDMAs. So go go over over the network. Um, and as you see, its constructor is super simple. Uh, basically, there's nothing special. Um, this kind stuff is the way we used to distinguish uh, what. You know what kind of transfer it is, and this is this is almost completely phased out at this point. It's kind of there mostly for documentation purposes these days. Really, it's all captured in the type now. A remote transfer descriptor knows innately, you know, how to do transfers uh, because it um, uh, because it has its own progress XD method. Uh, so again, old code that you should ignore, new faster code down here. And, you know, initially it's got a structure very, very similar to the mem copy thing, right? We build some sequence caches, we ask for addresses, we figure out what ports they are and how many bytes we can transfer. And then, um, and then the place where it gets a little bit different is that, um, there's a little bit of logic here for 1D and 2D, which is actually mostly irrelevant now because, um, 1D is the common case. So let's let's imagine the case where we're doing uh, a contiguous copy, uh, since that's what's natively supported by it. Then uh, the differences you'll see are down here, where we decide, okay, we're going to do a 1D copy. Um, so we figure out, okay, well, which remote node am I talking to? Because it's remote memory. Uh, let's get in a what is called a remote address that describes the location of remote memory I want to write to. Uh, then we'll get our local pointer. Uh, uh, for the source data, and then we create uh, an active message, right? That's going to be the remote write. So, so it's going to be a write one D message. It it names the local data. It names the destination remote address, 
Um, and, uh, oh, sorry, this is where we ask, sorry, this is another bit of flow control. This is where we ask the network, hey, do you have a recommendation on the max payload uh, to do something that's not going to, to you know, totally uh, monopolize the network for a long time? So this this comes out in, yeah, I think, megabytes and stuff in, in InfiniBand, for example. So we do that. We trim the size that way as well. Uh, and then down here is where we actually create the active message. Uh, so we, we, still, we have the addresses we need already. Uh, we go and do this, and so you can see a couple interesting things here, right? So the parameters of the active message, the part of the active message is actually the identity of the downstream uh, transfer descriptor, uh, if any, because we're going to want that active message as as the bits are there. We want to immediately update the sequence, uh, the sequencer on on that downstream transfer descriptor, so that it can uh, immediately start consuming the data. We don't we don't want to wait for an act to come all the way back to to the the source node and, and send us a separate message. So, so the updating the downstream flow control is done as part of the active message uh, handler. The other thing we do now that we're asynchronous is that um, we can't immediately update our our spans ourselves. We have to we have to be told that you know either the read or the remote write are done. And so um, we use the local and remote completion features of an active message. Basically, call this little object when when the local reads are done, and we can update our read span. And call this one when the when the remote writes are done, and we can update the write span. And so we advance the the address list cursors as we did before, but we do not update the spans here. The only time uh, the spans get updated is in the case um, where we're throwing away data because the scatter or gather, uh, you know, had no local uh, destination uh, or no no source or no destination for the the scatter. So the sequence assemblers are not used too much here, but they need to for the the scatter and gather case. But the rest of the structure is pretty much the same. The the main loop looks very similar. It's just how do you issue the requests and how do you track their their completion. Um, so the, the CUDA one um, is similar in spirit to this. It's a little more complicated because there's so many different ways to initiate CUDA copies and, and you know, um, uh, other folks on the team have been busy adding additional ways. So now, you know, it used to just be to call CUDA mem copy 1D or 2D or 3D and now there's cases where we kick off kernels and the like too. And so, but most of that complexity is just in, in the part of the code that would be the, you know, and, and you know, and Whereas here it's active message, uh, blah, blah blah active message commit, right? This is basically the code to to launch a remote write over the over the network. The corresponding code on the CUDA side is, is um, uh, quite a bit more than than 20 lines, although I think I think it may have been refactored so it may actually be more legible than this, uh, which would be nice. Uh, we are at the top of the hour though, and I feel like I've I've mostly covered that. I didn't get into the guts of exactly. Um, you know, if you follow the read and write completion stuff, you'll be able to see how how it notifies peer uh, transfer descriptors to update their sequences. And you could go look inside the, you know, span exists thing to see how the flow control works. But from 10,000 feet, I think this is the, the basics of it. And if folks have more questions, it probably makes sense to ping me and we can talk, you know, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on, -one on, on specific topics as, as people like. But I think I will leave it there for now. Okay, no questions. Two more minutes for questions. Yeah, if there are any questions, happy to. Okay. okay, well then, thank you everybody for your attention. And and for the folks that do kind of think about this more uh, and, and or come back to the recording and listen to it then, if you do have questions later, don't be shy. Come find me. All right. Thanks, Sean. Sure. Okay.